Hello, everyone. Good day. Good day. Good to have you. I'm Dr. Doina Tewalagun. I'm director at Delta, and I am delighted to be with you and my guest on the second episode of the Delta Talk series. In this series, we will be talking about what you, our listeners, can do to create more diverse, inclusive, and equitable cultures at work. At Delta, we believe that when each person flourishes, organizations thrive. And we pride ourselves on doing evidence-based work and offering practical solutions that work. We will discuss topics that are important to you based on common themes or challenges facing our clients or prevailing trends that impact inclusion strategies at work or thought leadership to help you start thinking and acting differently to make change happen for inclusion in a sustained way. We are always keen to hear from you. What would you like us to talk about? What topics or ideas do you struggle with? What would you like some helpful clarification on? We would be very happy to hear and work with you and use these as themes for future conversations. For those joining us live, it is a delight to have you with us. There will be an opportunity to complete a four question survey at the end to tell us about topics that you would like us to discuss. But for everyone else who is listening to this after this moment, please email us on info at deltaralphasci.com with anything inclusion related you would like us to help you figure out. Our sessions will be recorded and will be shared on our social media platforms afterwards. Thank you all for your attendance. And for those joining us live, we will stop recording at the end of the conversation I am about to have with Dorothea Bannerman Bruce. And then when we end the conversation and the when we end the conversation and the recording, we will open up for questions. We do have, a, however, welcome questions in chat at any point. If we do not get a chance to answer your questions on here, we will definitely follow up with an email and address any questions we haven't had time to pick up today. I am so thrilled to be here with our guest. Dorothea Vanneman Bruce, and I will hand over to Dorothea right now to say a hello. Hello, everyone, and thank you very much, Doyen. Um, I think this kind of session has been in the making for, for a while. Uh, Doyen has been asking me to, to kind of come along. We've finally been able to, to do that. So I'm delighted to be here with you all today. So I'm Dorothea Bannerman Bruce. I am head of lawyer learning at the Linklaters in London. Um, we are a global um, law firm headquartered in London, but with offices across the globe. And my primary function is to look after the skills development of our lawyers, in, in particular our senior lawyers, as they progress um, within their careers. So really thinking about the, the other skills that they need to have to be well-rounded professionals, um, not just their technical skills. So in this session today, we're hoping that we are going to give you an opportunity to think about the meritocracy myth. And we'll do our best to help you understand why assuming that meritocracy as a status quo is, you know, what we'll be looking at kind of why assuming that it's problematic. Um, we'll also think about think how and, and why everyone needs to learn how to challenge this myth of meritocracy. And also think about offering some practical um, steps and guidance so that you could all aspire to creating a truly meritocratic process for diverse talents to prosper um, within your various organisations. So Doyen, over to you. Absolutely. So very much looking forward to this conversation, Dorothea, like I've said a, a number of times already. Um, so just to get everyone up to speed, last time Delta talked the inclusion ecosystem. Uh, you can see that um, in our kind of social media channels on, on YouTube. And when we talked to the inclusion ecosystem, one key takeaway was that everyone has a role to play in driving inclusion. So it's not just people who are disadvantaged or belong to underrepresented groups. Actually, everybody has a role to play because it benefits everyone. 
So one practical way you can drive inclusion as a member of the inclusion ecosystem is to understand that there is a myth of meritocracy in many workplaces. I might go as far as saying in all workplaces. And one of the roles that you can play is to help other people understand that that is probably not where we currently are, i.e. a meritocratic space or organization, but is where we want to get to. So I would just like to kind of kick off the conversation or continue the conversation with um, what it means. What does it mean to talk about the notion of meritocracy in organizations? So the idea of meritocracy was introduced by the author Michael Young in 1958 in one of his writings called The Rise of Meritocracy. And the idea behind that work is that meritocracy represents a vision, an ideal, an aspiration where power and privilege, so people who attain power and privilege, where that role is allocated or that position is allocated by individual merit. So I'll just say that again. Meritocracy represents this vision, this ideal, that when you get to a position of power or privilege, it is as a result of your individual merit, not by social origin or background or anything else that you were born with, it was just your hard work. So some people might find it helpful to think about a, a simple equation where IQ plus effort is equal to merit. Now, when we think about the idea of the myth of meritocracy, um, from the research I could find, the earliest mention of that was in a Washington Post article in 1990. But since then, certainly in the academic literature and also in more popular literature, so for example, uh, Michael Sandel's book on the tyranny of merit, um, we're starting to think about the idea of the myth, the myth of meritocracy. And what I just want to do to introduce the idea of the myth is to use a little bit of an analogy or a metaphor. And one of the things I was thinking about preparing in preparing for this conversation is the idea of climbing a mountain. So I, I am not a mountain climber or hiker by any means. So, you know, forgive me for any, you know, any uh, mountaineering enthusiasts for using this metaphor. But imagine, you know, you're climbing a mountain. I imagine that if we were going to do that, that in order to be kind of best prepared for this um, expedition, that you will have some equipment, you'll have some training, you will have a team of people around you. So, you know, in your equipment, you know, backpack, you'll have all of the things that you need to, you know, kind of um, to kind of climb the, 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 the mountain face. You'll have the food and the resources, the sustenance that you need. But even prior to that, you would have had moments where people are saying, oh, yeah, here's a trial run. Have a good, this is what it looks like. You have experts telling you this is what you need. And then when you're doing the actual climbing, in addition to your equipment, in addition to, you know, the training, you have people who might even be there, you know, your team, like in terms of physical support in climbing or personal encouragement, you know, when you're like, oh, God, and they're like, no, one more, one more. And so this idea of being prepared to climb that mountain, I want to contrast it with someone else who didn't have the equipment, didn't have the training, didn't have the people, and is just climbing that mountain by themselves. And in reality, I want to offer the idea that success in careers is a result of privilege and advantages that have been passed down from generation to generation in some uh, circumstances. And that one's personal circumstances, such as the type of school we go to, the quality of education we have, the access we have to tutors and role models, who we meet over time actually gives us that equipment to climb the mountain and we don't all have that. So now that we have a definition and a concept, I just want to pass back to Dor Dorothea to say a little bit more about why this topic is important to her. Thank you, Doreen. So 
you know, when I think about my role, I always kind of say my role is to build the confidence and the capability of people within the organisation that I work in. However, in order to do that, I really need to understand where they're starting from. So Doyen kind of uses the example of a, uses the metaphor of a mountain. I sometimes think about this as a race in that we're all trying to get to a particular point, which is hopefully the finish line. But it's just that some people are starting from different perspectives and we just need to understand where they are and then what we do to support them. So for me, especially thinking about my profession and the legal profession, it's about how you can kind of build on your very strong and excellent technical skills. And we know that if it was if progression was just based on merit, there would be even more lawyers, even more partners, even more senior leaders in law firms. But we don't always see that um, within the profession. And I'm sure that applies to many of you within your organisations or your particular sector. So for me, it, the whole piece around the meritocracy myth is important because I think we need to, to think about A, each individual circumstance or can, and trying to understand different perspectives and then B, think about what we need to do to help people progress because technical um, excellence is not always going to be enough. And sometimes I love using the phrase, what got you here won't get you there because you can kind of work really hard to kind of at entry level and to get to to that kind of pivotal point within your career but then it's like what what else what are the other things you need to know to be able to I'll use Doyen's metaphor here climb that mountain move from base camp and climb up that mountain and that's that's why I think it's really important to think about the role that meritocracy myth creates. Thank you, Dorothea. Thank you so much for particularly drawing on your experience of what's happening in the law sector and many, many other professional services, but perhaps a number of other careers and organizations um, that uh, are pertinent for our listeners. And I know there's a number of listeners on the call who have a range of different, who are coming from a range of different backgrounds, a range of different nationalities, a range of different, um, I mean, almost like kind of like movements, like transition or immigrant mm -hmm. positions. And I want to say a little bit more about why this was important for me to have this conversation. So many of you will know that when I, that when I describe myself, I talk about the fact that I grew up in Nigeria. And so the reason I'm particularly interested in the meritocracy myth is because it actually has a lot of personal resonance for me and for the people on this call, for a number of people on this call, this might play true to you as well. So I grew up in Lagos. Uh, both of my parents had what, what was clear to me as a child as really kind of thriving careers where they they um they really enjoyed it they were well compensated for it we were in we lived very very comfortably um and you know even my grandparents so there was a a generation of of people who were educated who um valued education and then many of my uncles and aunties and also my cousins there was very much a uh, uh, and offered many, many opportunities, many, many role models, a sense that there were, that the, the world was available for us in order to, for us to, um, for us to benefit from. Uh, when I think about, so that's in terms of my family. When I then think about my school, I had a very solid education. I went to, I had some private education. A lot of my uh, siblings, my siblings and my uh, cousins, a lot of us benefited from private education in terms of where we lived, we, things were, we were safe, we, we could uh, predictably count on uh, resources in terms of, you know, things that would just help us get through in terms of uh, additional classes or, uh, uh, or things like electricity and water. So in many, many ways, my growing up, my environment enabled me to thrive and leverage from the natural talents that I had, such that 
it was implicitly clear to me that I had what I needed to climb that mountain, the mountain of life. I had people who had succeeded in terms of that mountain climbing around me. And I had people who assumed that when I finished university and I got into my career, that I would be successful. Now, a number of people on this call also know that soon after my higher education, and soon after high school, I mean, I went to, I moved to the UK. And so my career has been in the UK. And one of the things I found was that when I moved to the UK and I started thinking about work and opportunities, I didn't quite have all of the equipment that I needed. I didn't have individuals who could tell me, who could show me the ropes, you know, kind of metaphorically. I didn't have people who would informally speak to me and give me guidance about tips with regards to what career steps to take. I didn't have people around me who had already walked this track extensively. And so it was clear to me when we think about meritocracy that actually the idea is that in any circumstance, you know, if we think about any workplace, there's the assumption that everybody has had in, in getting there, everybody has had an equal and fair shot at success and everybody has the equal opportunity to succeed in the organization. And that if you just work hard or if you're good enough, you will rise to the top based on your own individual talent. That is, everyone has the same chance to rise because the assumption is that success is all down to individual effort. And you know what, when we think about the research, bear in this in mind, there's something that's even more alarming that I just want to share with our audience now, is that many of us who rise to the top, we often believe that we did it because of our own personal sense of worth. This is called the self-serving bias. For many of us who are successful, we attributed that success just to us. Dot, in your experience, why should we not make some of these assumptions? Thanks, Diane. So, you know, when I think about, about this, again, I go back to your point, you know, you, you picked up kind of two points, equality and equity. So equality, assuming that everyone's going to be treated in the same way, but actually equity, really thinking about what's happening and trying to level that, that playing field. And so just to give you a couple of examples, the kind of the things that I see, let's start with access to higher education, to kind of people to come in and, you know, give them the opportunity to flourish so when i think about kind of university fees in the uk the us other parts of the world i'm just astounded as to you know how expensive it is now when i was going to university i was very lucky you know things were were, were different then back in the day um but my parents were able to kind of fund me through university i didn't come out with the debt that um a number of people come out with now in the US, UK. And that was kind of, that is the privilege that, that I have. I was able to, able to do that. And that opened a number of doors for me. It allowed me to kind of progress within kind of my chosen career at the time. Um, it gave me opportunities to meet people, friendships that I would, um, I would have for life. And those net, starting to build those networks and those networks have been really helpful in my career. But not everyone will have access to that. So for me, you know, that is that is immediately a kind of a point where you might be the brightest person. And we see it so many times. People have got the huge potential, but it's overcoming this hurdle to kind of get them into the, the kind of the system, the university system, if that is what they, they choose. Thinking about it from another perspective, I sometimes see it also in terms of opportunities within organizations which will help people progress to more senior roles or which will give them the opportunities to thrive um, within their current role in an organization and sometimes the, there are barriers that prevent them from from kind of progressing or spotting those opportunities or being given access to those opportunities it could be based on kind of class 
um, it could be gender, um, visible or hidden disabilities, um, kind of uh, different things, but different circumstances, life stages. And I think, that, you know, sometimes we kind of, yeah, forget that actually there, there are other things that might be happening. And I suppose it's the thinking about things from a truly intersectional perspective. We like to think about kind of the identities that we have when we talk about intersectionality. But I think we also need to think about the context that people find themselves in. And within organisations, I think we need to be um, more ready, more open, just to think about what else could be happening. What's the context? And then going back to your metaphor about, you know, the, the support team, how do you support somebody to, first of all, get to base camp? That's maybe the access point or the kind of the point where they're looking for new opportunities. And then how do you support them through? Because different people will need different support. And here for me, it's not about fixing people, um, because I think that is sometimes a narrative that can kind of come through these conversations when we talk about diversity and inclusion and kind of trying to level the playing field. I'm not talking about fixing individuals. I'm talking about understanding the context, but actually looking at the system, looking at the environment, looking, having a, a complete 3D view, 360 view to think about what we do with the, how we support e the individual, each other to help others, and then how that benefits the whole organization sector, but also I suppose, society as a whole. Yeah, absolutely. I, I love that you've highlighted the difference between equity, equality, focus on the individual, i.e. not fixing the system, so versus focus on the system, focus on the context. And these are some of the areas that sometimes people get a little confused about. So thank you, Dor Dorothea, for, for raising those important issues. But okay, so if if the meritocracy myth is only, or if meritocracy is only partly applicable to some people, you know, so if these assumptions are only partly true for some of us, um, how how should we help listeners start to think differently about meritocracy? And I guess I'm thinking of of a couple of points at this point in the conversation. I think there's something about really taking a role for all our listeners in terms of debunking the myth of meritocracy. So you will find that a lot of people talk about it. A lot of people, particularly in the diversity and inclusion space, kind of raise it as if it is something that is at risk. Um, so one of the pieces of work that I did with a couple of colleagues uh, a couple of years ago on the for the Financial Reporting Council, we evaluated the annual reports of some of the largest UK listed firms, so the FTSE 100. And we found that often when organizations were talking about diversity, they were also kind of saying, oh, actually, but, you know, let's make sure that we don't risk meritocracy as if meritocracy is present and adding diversity to it, um, you know, kind of like dilutes it. So I just would like to invite our listeners that anytime you hear the word meritocracy assumed as a status quo, you challenge it challenge it when you hear it. It is not the status quo. It is not the current situation. Yes, it is what we are aspiring to. Absolutely, it is an ideal. It is where we want to get to. But right now we have, we probably have a meritocracy for some people, but what we want is meritocracy for all people. And in fact, I invite you to consider the fact that it is when we have diversity, that there is evidence of merit for all, that actually where there is no diversity, that's probably evidence that this is not meritocratic. You know, I just want to, you know, suggest that we think about that, that diversity in itself is evidence, is our way towards merit. So the first thing is to challenge it when you hear it. And the second thing, just drawing on what Dorothea has said, is to challenge the assumption that this is around being given, given people like a leg up or special treatment. You know, remember, if you look at that mountain analogy for the people who are best prepared to get to the top are those who already have the equipment, they have had the training. And for some of us, 
we are not even aware that we're carrying all of these resources that help us make it, help us navigate it. This is what privilege is. Privilege is often invisible to those who have it. So this is not about giving people without equipment a leg up. This is like what Dorothea said, this is leveling the playing field. So if you hear people saying, oh, right, what about special treatment? That's no, it is actually not. It is equalizing the playing field. So if you hear that, speak up and interrupt it. And interrupt it. Challenge the assumption that underrepresentation is the problem of the people without the equipment. The problem is some people have the equipment. How do we make sure that everybody has the equipment? And so I know we've been talking for a little while, so I just want to do a quick, quick recap in terms of where we've got to in the conversation. So yes, merit is a good thing. It is an ideal, but we're not yet there because we're not operating in a level playing field or you know, climbing a mountain where everybody has equal access to all of the equipment that they need to get to the top of the mountain. So an invitation to you to think about what you have been given to navigate the workplace, how your experiences leading to and even in the workplace help you navigate, give you the tools and the skills and allow people to give you assumptions that you are one of those people who are going to succeed. So think about your own benefits. If you hear people talk about merit, challenge those assumptions. Acknowledge that meritocracy for all is what we aspire towards. So I'm gonna pass back to Dorothea to talk about some more practical tips for people in organizations. Okay, thank you, Doreen. So I think, yeah, we need to kind of interrupt this, um, this kind of myth that, it, that, it, uh, that exists. And I'd like to share maybe three suggested approaches that you can, just practical approaches that you can think about um, to help to build meritocratic uh, cultures. The first one is to think about your role as a leader or a line manager. Um, and also when I say leader, I don't mean leader with a capital L. You don't have to have a leader or manager title. I think all of us can do this. We can be leaders with a small L. Um, you know, there will be people that will be inf that we can influence, people who will see us as role models, people who will come to us for advice. So the first thing I think that it's really important to do is to give honest and critical feedback on skills gaps. Now, we definitely within the legal profession sometimes struggle with the concept of feedback. It is seen as a, oh, a negative thing, especially for lawyers who like to be perfectionists, like to have all the answers, like to get everything right, who've always excelled and been have been great at um, great at everything in life. But actually, feedback is really important. And I think feedback can be important because, first of all, you need to kind of flip the concept of feedback. For me, feedback is data. Feedback is data on how well you're doing. What are your strengths? How can you leverage those strengths? But also, where have you got areas where you can do something differently, where there can be a shift? And sometimes you need somebody to be able to give you that, um, that information. And again, one of the things that we see through research is that people from underrepresented um, groups do not always have the same quality level of feedback as they progress throughout their careers. So there's a gap that, that starts to exist there. So again, that is not meritocratic. If we are not being open and honest with people and giving them the opportunities to do something with, you know, with this data. Secondly, I think on this kind of, this whole point, I think it's important to think about um, how people are, how you, people are being perceived. So this is kind of helping people to under, to see maybe the kind of the blind spots that they may have. And when you are working hard, when you're trying to get to that base camp, you may not always see what you're doing well or the things that you're missing. And again, I think if you can help people understand how they are perceived, you kind of almost start giving them a bit of a map, uh, kind of more data in terms of what they do as they go up that, that mountain and how they might want to kind of like move around that rock, how they might want to handle that, that climb, what's going to help others in the team spot that they might need some help as they go up. And then I think there's something about providing stretch opportunities because actually 
we those stretch opportunities are the moments where you know people can actually kind of those points where people are vulnerable maybe a little bit of discomfort but you can challenge yourself and do something new those are typically the opportunities where we start to thrive and I'm sure you can all think of examples of times where you've been working on a new matter of projects or something which has challenged you a little bit but actually that feeling when you're kind of getting there and at the end when you succeed it's a wonderful feeling so how can we bring that into the workplace a lot more and that will kind of help to change the change the systems and help people thrive a couple of other quick points i think shedding a light on the shadow process so here i'm talking about kind of the the things that happen behind the scenes the things that people may not always know about um, and here, this is, again, the privilege that you might have within your organisation or your sector. You know things that other people don't. So to the extent that you can, help them to navigate um, navigate this, share, you know, some of the processes that might happen, some of the kind of the unspoken things, the things that just kind of happen um, happen maybe just organically, especially if somebody's kind of just joined an organization or a sector, how are they gonna find this out? So what can you do to shed light on the shadow process? And then finally, I just think about the kind of that org the organizational dynamics. So to the extent that you can, again, just think about how you can help your colleagues understand the political landscape that they might be um, experiencing. And here, this is kind of like the map that you need to climb the mountain. Um, what should you avoid? Which path should you avoid? Which ones do you go to, to go up? What happens when there's a bit of a snowstorm? How do you how do you do that? So I think those are you know some some of the key things I would consider. And then finally, think about what you can do to actively build affinity as well. So the affinity bias is kind of that the bias that causes people to gravitate towards people who are like us. And we can see that in a number of different ways. We've probably all experienced it as well. Times when we've been part of the in-group, times where maybe we've been part of the out-group and we haven't had that, um, that support around us. So always think about the privilege that you have, and we all have privilege in different ways. What you can do to kind of help others um, what can what can you share how can you bring bring people in and actually if you look at the kind of the groups that you are communicating with the help that you might give others um that this kind of the informal stuff that you drop to people actually is there a pattern starting to to come through are you kind of basically talking to the same people all the time or are you sharing and expanding your network is it truly diverse because i think we all have a part to play in that I, I love that, Dorothea. So really rich uh, yet practical suggestions for leaders, not with a capital L, because all of us, many of us will have different ways in which we influence or lead people in our organization. So think about the quality of the feedback you're given. Think about uh, making sure that people don't aren't limited to the shadow processes you know think about all of the ways in which many different types of people understand all of the various side conversations or informal conversations that are happening to help them progress think about sharing organizational politics or dynamics to help people kind of have that map I love that and think about the natural affinities and the biases that might come in there, i.e. some of the ways in which we connect with some people who are like us and exclude people who are not like us. And the more many of us do this, the more we can share the capacity to climb that mountain so that when we all kind of go from base camp to the top, there is even more to benefit all of us uh, because we have enabled that capacity uh, for everyone. So thank you so much. And that brings us to, um, as we, you know, we're, we're now approaching the close and I just want to share a few thoughts uh, with our audience. Uh, again, you know, really reiterating, yes, we aspire for a merit-based system in our workplace, but we are far from it. And, uh, you know, perhaps for some of us, we need to take a little bit of time to really think through what are the ways in which we have this equipment, these privileges, these resources. 
and think through, well, who are, other, who are the other people who might not have had that? And what are the ways in which we can build ourselves, build our teams, build our workforces so that everyone has what they need in order to bring the best of who they are? And so I just want to leave with some more ideas or suggestions for some of our listeners. I'll start with those who belong to uh, underrepresented groups. And just an invitation to think about your own experience. Um, perhaps when you get beyond base camp or when you get to higher positions in your careers, don't pull up the ladder when you are there. You know, think about the people who are coming behind. Think about how you can use, how you understand the landscape now, your own privilege, your own insights, your own resources to share tips with others so they can um, have their own, you know, backpack full up. Uh, with Brilliant. what Sorry, they require. You there. Yes, absolutely. Also, just, just on that one as well, I think mm -hmm. also just think about if you're from an underrepresented group as well and you're in that kind of, you're in those conversations mm -hmm. and you think about actually how you can use your position to help educate others within your peer networks and, and kind of others around you and even slightly higher the next couple of layers up because I think that's something that doesn't always happen and I mm -hmm. think you know, if, if we're thinking about how we support others and rather than kind of pulling up a ladder, I think that's also a really important thing. Yeah, absolutely. And and for others who were maybe earlier in their careers, like, Do like Dorothea said, um, seek feedback, uh, look for mentors, uh, sponsors, uh, champions who can open up their own networks uh, so that you can, you know, like learn the code, so to speak. Um, and, you know, perhaps a little bit of bravery, you know, don't be hesitant, ask. And when you share these experiences or, um, you know, make these requests that might actually jolt other people and raise their awareness, like Dorothea said, particularly for those perhaps in, in senior positions, like being using that power and privilege to say, this is what it's like for others. That bravery at all levels um, is probably beneficial for, for many of us within the organization. That's for people who belong to underrepresented groups. And in addition to that, a reminder for leaders, for managers, for line managers, do challenge the assumption that there is only one standard way to showcase talent or to identify talent or to identify merit. Because those ways that you identify are probably things that you are used to based on, you know, you having the resources, you having the equipment required to run that race or to climb that mountain. And what I want to do is just share some things that you might consider, particularly if you're in a recruitment position or a position to make decisions about people's progression or promotion. One of the things that we're finding from research is actually that some of these ways in which we define merit or in which we signal merit may not necessarily be the best sources of evidence of merit, that actually they are evidence of these privileges. So you might want to consider, for example, whether the qualifications you're saying you want are absolutely necessary. Is that qualification in that particular university or that particular you know, degree result, does that really signal, is that the only indicator of the merit or the talent that you're looking for? You might even want to go a step further and consider removing some of these indicators or supposed indicators of merit. For example, name, we know that we're biased when we look at particular names. And for some people, we hear a name and we think, ah, okay, that probably is the kind of person we want. And for other people, we see that name and we think, oh, that's a little unusual. I'm not quite sure. And we do this often subconsciously. So you might want to remove name. You might want to remove age, nationality, education, ethnic background, those sorts of little signals that cause bias, but we use as shortcuts, but actually aren't accurate when we think about what talent looks like. Alternatively, you might want to consider what are ways in which people can have what we call realistic job previews. The best way of assessing talent is getting people to actually do the job. That is the best way. 
you could also think about ways in which in which you want people to, you want to give people opportunities to upskill prior to making the decision so offering support for cv writing offering support for interview skills i know a lot of organizations and other institutions are thinking about actually sending interview questions in advance because we know that some people are you know have the social skills because they've been trained they've had the opportunity to practice interviews they have people in their family who tell them what to expect or a particular schools that they've been to so you might want to give people interview skills in advance or give them those interview questions as well so i've left you with many many options many many ideas practical tips for you to potentially take away with you as we all kind of fight the good fight in terms of disrupting the meritocracy myth. And I'm just going to hand over to Dorothea uh, to see if there's any final key takeaway that you would like our listeners to go away with. Um, okay, you said one, I'm actually gonna go for two. I'm gonna try to split it up, I'm being very cheeky. So the first, the first one is just, you know, remembering talent is not always going to be enough to get you up the mountain. It will get you to base camp, but it might not get you um, further up the mountain. Secondly, um, I think think about what you can do um, to help somebody get up that mountain. So think about your role within the support team and what you can what you can do there. But also if you are kind of somebody who is coming, you are at base camp now and you're kind of coming up, actually just remembering you don't have to do this by yourself. You can, at Doyen's point, you can ask for help. It may not always be the people that are immediately obvious, but actually ask for help and start to build that um, that support group. And that support group can, can be a virtual support group. It could be an in-person support group. There are a number of different ways that you can, you can do it. And people in that support group don't have to be there forever. They can be there for that just period in time just to get you through or to give you that little bit of information to help you move up to that next stage. So actually, I think that's probably three things that I've snuck in. So those are, those are my takeaways. Love it. Thank you so much, Dorothea. It's been great being in conversation with you today. And thank you to everyone for tuning in. Uh, we're looking forward to hearing your thoughts, your questions. Um, as we had said in the opening, in the Delta Talk series, we'll be talking about what you, our listeners, uh, can do what you're interested in and what you can do to create diverse, inclusive and equitable cultures at work, because we believe that when each person flourishes, organizations thrive.